Have you ever finished knitting a project where the yarn changed in appearance and feel after you washed it? Maybe the yarn got softer or you noticed that it looked fuzzier than before it was washed. The fact that soaking yarn can not only change your knitting gauge, but also alter your project's visual and tactile properties means that the finished object could turn out surprisingly beautiful or a disaster. If you're interested in maintaining more control over your hand knit projects, then keep on watching to find out what happens when yarn blooms. Hi everybody and welcome back to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. I wanted to do this video as a follow-up on last week's video, which was about yarn weights. To prepare for that video, I think I did more work than I've ever done for any other video. I spent over three weeks pouring through resources to try to sort out the confusion of yarn weights. I thought that maybe looking at the history of assessing yarn weights would provide some clarification on the topic. But after reading numerous scholarly sources, things were more confusing than ever. And I ended up cutting out a lot of information in order to streamline things and stay within a reasonable amount of time. But one topic I wanted to talk a little more about is what happens to your gauge when you wash and block your knitting. Now I did a video last year uh, about blocking your knitting and I, I'll link that down below in case you haven't seen it and want to check that out. But today, rather than discussing the general act of blocking, I wanted to focus on specifically what happens to yarn when it gets soaked as part of the washing and blocking process. So, you might be surprised to learn that the qualities of a yarn can be drastically changed by immersion in water. One of the most significant transformations that can happen is that the yarn blooms. Blooming refers to yarn plumping up, getting fuzzier, becoming fuller looking when it's washed. The yarn increases in thickness, giving it a halo or a fluffy appearance, and it loses some of its stitch definition. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about, here's a picture showing two socks. The one on the left has not been washed and the one on the right was washed and dried. Hopefully you can see that the washed one on the right has bloomed with more of a fuzzy halo on it than the unwashed one on the left. You might also be able to tell that the stitches look more filled in because the yarn is puffed up. Here's another picture showing yarn that hasn't been knit up yet and the yarn on the top has not been washed whereas the yarn on the bottom has been washed and dried. You can probably see that the bottom yarn has bloomed it looks plumper, fluffier, and fuzzier than the yarn on the top. There are times when the fuzziness doesn't show up until the item is washed, and part of the fuzziness is a result of the type of fiber used to make the yarn. Yarn blooming mostly happens with animal fibers like wool, angora, and cashmere. Changes are less likely to happen with plant fibers like cotton and linen or with synthetic fibers like acrylic. One of the reasons animal fibers are more likely to bloom has to do with the structure of individual fibers. Animal fibers are made out of protein and most of them have a structure similar to that of human hair. The main components of a single fiber are the cuticle and the cortex. The cortex makes up 90% of the fiber and consists of two different types of internal cells. Each has a different chemical composition and they expand differently when they absorb moisture, making the fiber bend. This creates the crimp or the waviness that we see in fibers like wool. On the outside of the wool fiber is a protective layer of scales called the cuticle. The cuticle cells overlap like shingles on a roof or scales on a fish. They are sometimes described as little barbs because it's the points of the scales that give wool the reputation for being prickly. These scales have a waxy coating called lanolin that is chemically bound to the surface. Lanolin is like the oil that our bodies produce to waterproof our skin. 
Now lanolin makes wool waterproof, but it's usually washed out during the processing of yarn. So what happens when wool yarn gets wet is that the cuticle cells expand, lift, or swing open like the hinges of an airplane wing. This process is facilitated even more when the water is hot or when an alkaline solution like soap or detergent is added. These factors can make the yarn swell, increasing the diameter of the fiber by up to 15 to 20 percent. Sometimes this swelling is used to good effect to make large molecules penetrate into the cortex like during the process of dyeing yarn. Sometimes this swelling is combined with agitation which results in felting where the cuticle scales interlock and hook together causing the fibers to become entangled. And then you end up with a thick matted fabric like you see in this felted bowl that I made. Felting really obscures the individual knit stitches because of how tangled those cuticle cells become. Now blooming is not the same as felting, but it is kind of a very mild form of it or the first step of it. You're using water to open up those cuticle cells and puff up the yarn. What's lacking is hot water because it's best to wash wool in tepid water um, specifically to avoid felting as well as the agitation to enmesh all those cuticle cells together. The important point that I wanted to make here is that when you knit a gauge swatch, it's always best to measure your gauge after you've washed it, blocked it, and let it dry, or treating it however you will treat the finished object. You may find that washing it will cause the yarn to bloom, which can create a completely different look and can affect your final gauge. Now, having said this about the structure of protein fibers from animals, let's contrast this with the structure of plant fibers like cotton and linen. In this picture on the left, you can see what wool, alpaca, and cashmere fibers look like under the microscope. And the cuticle cells or scales are clearly visible. Toward the right side of the picture, you can see silk, linen, and cotton fibers under a microscope, which don't have any overlapping cuticle cells like that. Research shows that under wet conditions, the cortex of a fiber tends to contract and the cuticle opens up, increasing the overall diameter of the yarn. So that explains why animal fibers like wool might get plumper, but cotton, which doesn't have the cuticle scales, tends not to bloom. Don't get me wrong, fibers like cotton and linen definitely change in the way they feel after being soaked. They're usually a lot softer and drapier than before they were washed, but they tend not to bloom as much as other fibers that have the cuticle scales. I didn't get to this in my video last week, but I did wash and block all four of the swatches I knit. If you remember, the swatches were all knit out of DK weight yarn, but the yarn in the swatches looked very different after I knit them. Here's a picture of the knit swatches that I showed last week. In the upper left, we have viscose yarn, the upper right is wool, the bottom left is a wool silk blend, and the bottom right is a cotton linen blend. You might wonder how much the swatches changed after I washed and blocked them. And for washing, I soaked them for about 20 minutes in tepid water with a little bit of wool wash mixed in and then lightly blocked them. For blocking, I didn't stretch them. I, I, I mainly just squared them up. So let's take a look at how the swatches compare before and after soaking. Here is the wool swatch before washing and blocking on the left and afterwards on the right. Does it look like the yarn bloomed? I don't know if it bloomed much. My gauge before washing was five and a half stitches per inch, and after blocking, it was five stitches per inch. Really, I think blocking evened out the stitches and smoothed the knitted fabric, but I'm not sure that the yarn really plumped up all that much. Now, let's look at the swatch made out of viscose yarn. Here you can see it before washing on the left and after on the right. Again, I don't see a big difference in the yarn as far as plumping up after washing. My gauge before washing was 5 stitches per inch, and after washing it was 4.75 stitches per inch.
It seems like that's again due to the stitches being evened out during blocking. So how about the wool silk blend? Here's a picture of the swatch before washing on the left and after on the right. Again, I don't see much blooming, but there definitely is a smoother look with more even stitches. My gauge before washing was 5.25 stitches per inch, and after washing, it was five stitches per inch. And lastly, let's look at the cotton linen blend. This picture shows the swatch before washing on the left and after washing on the right. Yet again, I see the stitches evening out, but I'm not noticing much blooming or fluffing up. My gauge before washing was 5.25 stitches per inch, and after washing and blocking, it was five stitches per inch. So even though none of these yarns from last week bloomed much, the one thing you will notice is that my gauge changed a bit. Not a huge amount, but even a quarter of a stitch per inch in a garment can make an enormous difference across the width of say a sweater, for example. Okay, so the yarns I knit swatches with last week didn't really bloom so much, but this show is about yarns that do bloom. So in order to show you some examples of blooming, I chose some other yarns to knit swatches out of. But before I talk about those yarns and show you the new swatches, let me go over with you the main factors that can affect the amount of bloom in a yarn. Now first, before I say anything more, I want to stress that it is impossible to predict with 100% certainty how much any particular yarn will bloom until you actually knit a swatch. So you definitely still want to do that. You can't really know how a yarn will behave and what kind of fabric you're creating until you soak it. That will tell you if the yarn would benefit from being knitted a little looser or maybe on bigger needles so there's room for the stitches to grow. But certain yarn qualities can help us anticipate how much a yarn might bloom when it's washed. First, the crimp or waviness of the fiber will affect blooming. The tighter the crimp of the fiber in the yarn, the more likely the yarn is to bloom. Now crimp is the undulations found in the individual fibers, and it's what gives fibers like wool a natural elasticity or memory. During yarn processing, a fiber's natural crimp is stretched and straightened, and it essentially wants to get back into its wavy state. In the form of yarn, these tiny crimps push against neighboring fibers to cause fluffiness, and this is especially brought out when the yarn is wet. Here are some pictures showing different crimp frequencies. For example, merino is well known for its fine, even crimp. The finest merino may have up to 100 crimps per inch. Rommeldale and Cormo also have a similar fine crimp. Shetland and Polworth have a good crimp as well. BFL or Blueface Lester, as well as Teeswater, don't have quite as high of a crimp count, but instead they have tiny ringlets. And then looking at the alpaca fibers over to the right side, you can see that Wakaya alpaca have some crimp in their fiber, but Surrey alpaca don't. Finally, look at the caracol sheep fiber. It has no crimp at all. Now, let's look at some plant fibers that are made from cellulose rather than protein that comprises animal fibers. In this picture, you can see what cotton fiber looks like in the upper left corner. That's linen fiber in the bottom left corner, and there's bamboo fiber in the bottom right corner. In the upper right, you see silk fiber, and silk is of course not a plant fiber, it's an animal fiber made from protein, but I included it here because I think you can see that all of these fibers have no crimp at all. And that's one reason you don't see much blooming in yarn made out of these fibers. Now, I have heard some people report that linen blooms nicely when it's washed, but I've never seen that myself. Um, you saw the cotton linen yarn I swatched last week, and that didn't really bloom. Um, I know linen does get softer and drapier when you wash it, but I haven't really seen it bloom. But if you have, let me know down below what yarn it was and what you did with it to get it to bloom. Okay, so anyway, a yarn made of fiber with a tight crimp is one indication that it might bloom, but there are several other considerations. 
Second is the amount of twist in the yarn. Tightly spun yarns are less likely to bloom, while looser spun yarns have more opportunity to bloom. This is because in loosely spun yarns, the fibers are less confined and constricted by the twist in the yarn, so the crimps are free to expand. When the yarn is tightly spun, the crimps are trapped and don't have room to puff out. In this picture, hopefully you can see the difference in how tightly spun these two yarns are. The white one has a very loose twist, whereas the blue one has a tighter twist. So the white one might be more likely to bloom based on the light twist. A third factor in determining how much a yarn will bloom has to do with how it is spun. In European spinning traditions, there are two main categories of spinning style, and they are called worsted and woolen. So first let's go over worsted spun yarn. In this context, the term worsted doesn't refer to the weight of the yarn. I'm not talking about worsted weight yarn here. We're talking about spinning worsted yarn. Worsted spun yarn is made from fiber that is both carded and combed, where the shorter fibers are removed. What's left are the longer fibers, generally four inches or longer, that are all lined up. When fibers are carded, be it on hand cards, a drum carder, or on industrial equipment, the fibers are brushed back and forth to break up the separate locks of wool. Here you can see the combing process. And this is the carding process with hand cards. And this is carding with a drum carder. kind of fiber prep for worsted spinning is a comb top. This is really the only prep where all the fibers are parallel and smooth with very little airspace between them. Worsted yarn is spun with a short draw to keep them that way. The resulting yarn has a tight twist and is dense, firm, smooth, and strong. Worsted yarns knit up into fabrics that have great stitch definition and nice drape. They're gonna be really good for knitting cables and showing off textured patterns. But because of the way they're constructed with all the fibers completely aligned and tightly spun, any bloom is gonna be less pronounced compared to woolen spun yarns. Now woolen spun yarn is produced from fiber that's only carded but not combed. It is spun from short fibers that are one to four inches in length. Woolen spun yarn can be made from rolags, bats, or roving. A rolag is a little poofy roll of fiber that's usually made with hand cards, like is being shown here. A bat is made on a drum carter and is like a blanket of fibers, and you can see that here. So the bat is carded, but more aligned than you would typically get in a rolag. Roving is another carded fiber prep that is usually about the thickness of your wrist, although it can vary. They are kind of a thinner version of a bat. What Rolags, bats, and roving have in common is that all the individual fibers overlap at a variety of angles, leaving air spaces throughout the fiber. This produces a very soft, lofty appearance. When the fibers are spun, air will be trapped between the jumbled up fibers and make a yarn that's very warm with a soft feel. Woolen yarns are more loosely spun and are more likely to bloom, and here's why. When the fibers in the yarn, random in length and nestled together every which way, when they're soaked in water, they get the chance to relax. As they dry, they readjust and mingle with each other even more, their cuticles expanding and their crimp intensifying, creating a solid and cohesive piece of fabric. This blooming has the effect of softening and blending the appearance of the stitches. And before I leave this topic, let me show you a comparison of woolen and worsted spun yarn.
Here you can see the worsted spun yarn is on the left and the woolen is on the right. The worsted yarn has more twist and a firmer appearance, while the woolen yarn is fluffier and softer in appearance. All right, so that was hopefully everything you needed to know about spinning style and how it affects yarn blooming. The last factor that's important in affecting the amount of bloom in a yarn is how the final product is blocked. After soaking the item, it can be lightly blocked or severely blocked. Light blocking might just include forming it into the shape you want by hand and then leaving it to dry. Severe blocking would involve stretching the knit fabric as far as possible and then pinning it in place while it dries. You can probably figure out that light blocking is going to be more conducive to letting the yarn bloom than severe blocking. Stretching the item to the max is going to keep the yarn under tension, giving it minimal opportunity to activate its fluffy potential. The crimp won't be able to emerge, and any pockets of air among the fibers are going to be squished by the strong tension on the yarn. So if you really want your yarn to bloom, just use a light blocking method. Shape the item by hand, or if you do need to pin it down, make sure the yarn is relaxed and not under tension. Okay, so those are some important factors to consider when assessing how much your yarn might bloom. In the event you are searching for a yarn that you want to bloom, here are some tips. First, look for a high crimp fiber like Merino, Cormo, Targi, or Corydale. And try to find a yarn that is spun woolen with a light to moderate twist. In looking through my stash, I found these two yarns that I thought I would try out to see how much the yarn would bloom. This pink one is Cormo in fingering weight. It feels nice and squishy and it's super springy and stretchy, but I wondered if it would be spun loosely enough to let it bloom, but I thought I would try it anyway. And the purple one is a worsted weight Corydale. It looks fairly loosely spun and it's another super springy yarn because of the tight crimp. So I thought I might have good luck with getting it to bloom. I wanted the stitches in my swatches to be fairly loose. So I knit them using bigger needles than I normally would with these yarns, just to give them a little room for the stitches to bloom. For fingering weight yarn, I normally use a US size one or 2.25 millimeter needles, but here I used a US size three or 3.25 millimeter needle. For worsted weight yarn, I would normally probably use a US size 7, which is a 4.5 millimeter needle. But for this swatch, I used a US size 9 or a 5.5 millimeter needle. For each swatch, I cast on 30 stitches and knit a stockinette stitch square with a garter stitch border. Then I soak the swatches for about 20 minutes in tepid water with a little bit of wool wash added. After that, I very lightly block the swatches and only pin them to shape them into a square. But I was careful not to pull or tug on them or stretch the yarn so that if it bloomed, we would be able to see it. Here are the results of my little yarn blooming experiment. First, this is the fingering weight Cormo yarn and I wasn't sure if it would bloom because it seemed like it might be spun a little tightly. On the left, you can see the swatch before soaking and blocking, and on the right is the same swatch after soaking and blocking. In comparing the two in the picture, it doesn't look like the yarn bloomed very much, but my gauge did change a little bit. Before soaking and blocking, my gauge was five and a half stitches per inch and eight rows per inch. Afterward, my gauge was down to five stitches per inch and 7.75 rows per inch. Now, even though it doesn't look like the yarn really puffed up, this disparity in gauge could make a big difference if you're knitting something that needs to fit right, like a sweater. So again, although it seems like the yarn didn't plump up a whole lot, it's still a lesson in the importance of washing and blocking your swatch to find out the final gauge. Now let's look at the swatch I made out of the worsted weight Corydale yarn. And this one was spun looser, so I thought it might be more likely that it would bloom. And here is a picture showing the swatch before soaking and blocking on the left and after soaking and blocking on the right. 
Wow, I think you can see that the stitches in this one really plumped up. The interesting thing is that my gauge changed about the same in this swatch as it did for the Cormo swatch. Starting out, it was four stitches per inch and 5.75 rows per inch. After soaking and blocking, it was three and a half stitches per inch and five and a half rows per inch. So the gauge changed about the same for both swatches, but the Corydale yarn really bloomed where the Cormo yarn didn't appear to bloom as much. All right, then to sum up what I've just talked about. If you wanna give your yarn a chance to bloom, it's best to choose animal fibers with tight crimping or a lot of waviness. Look for a yarn that is loosely spun. If you can, find one that's spun using the woolen technique. And after you knit it up, just lightly block it by arranging it into shape with your hands and leaving it flat to dry or use pins if you need to square it up or something like that. But you want to avoid pulling the yarn taut or, or hanging it so that gravity pulls on it. And always knit a swatch and wash and block it to determine the resulting gauge. You won't have the surprises that you might by knitting with unwashed yarn. Well, that brings us to the end of class today. And now it's time for you to go down to the comment section and share your experiences with yarn blooming. Have you ever had any yarn bloom unexpectedly in a project? Have you ever thought a yarn would bloom and then it didn't? What projects have you made where blooming affected the appearance of the finished object? And what kinds of yarns have you seen bloom? Or maybe this idea of blooming is a new thing for you. Let me know about that as well. I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on yarn blooming. Of course, you can always leave questions about today's show and ideas for future show topics, or just leave me a comment to say hi. As always, I will include links to everything I talked about today in the information box right below this video. Just click on show more to open up the box and you'll see all the links there. Thank you for spending some time with me today, and I'll see you next time. And in the meantime, stay smart and have a sparkly week.